Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. Let's, let's go here. We're going into chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. And um, Apostle Paul says here, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Well, I guess we're in the last days because there's a lot of Perilous times, aren't there? Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, trady, I mean traitors, heady, high minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For uh, and we'll just stop. Let's get, let's pick up verses one through five. So Paul says here that at the end of uh, you know in the last days or the end of the messianic age we're li- which we're living in, um, that perilous or grievous, difficult, terrible, hard to live in times would come. And then verses 2 through 5 are one sentence. I mean, if you took this sentence to your teacher in school, you'd probably get in trouble. Um, but it's a, it's a nice long run on sentence. Uh, but here we have, there are 18 evil characteristics of men in the last days. Uh, first of all, lovers of their own selves, that's self-loving. Covetous, lovers of money. Uh, these twin sins are which uh, flow all others um, that are categorized here. The boasters and proud have similar traits. A boaster is a braggart, um, and, uh, which was a, in, in the um, original Greek, it came from a word that meant like a quack doctor. You know, snickle. You know, the guys say, you, you know, uh, if you all watched Anne of Avonlea with your kids, with your girls, hallelujah, you know, they saw her, the uh, stuff that would turn her hair nice, beautiful raven black, and it came out green. Never saw Anne of Avonlea, huh? Anna Green Gables. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see here. Proud is a word that means to show oneself above. In other words, uh, they're haughty. They're arrogant. They're prone to, to swagger. They're just, you know, whatever. Uh, blasphemers, evil speaking, slanderous, abusive people. Um, they speak disrespectfully of God and their fellow men. Disobedient parents. Word comes from word that means they break civil and moral laws. We need to obey our parents. Isn't that right? You know, and really what that is, parents establish the civil and moral laws in your life. And the, 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 he says in the last days, they'll be disobedient to parents. Um, in, in Roman law, if you struck your father, that was just as bad as murder. That, that act of disrespect was as bad as murder under the Roman law. Um, abusing a parent in the Greek culture was, uh, could cause you to be disinherited. Um, Jews honor their parents because it's one of the Ten Commandments. And then the next word, unthankful, means ungrateful. Next one, unholy, means offenders of all that is holy. Now, if you don't think we're living in that day right now, uh, you're an ostrich. You got your head stuck in the sand singing, drop kick me Satan through the goalpost of life, because that's where you're sitting right now. Okay? Now, they're, 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 uh, they are people who are offenders of all that holy. Um, then we have, you know, uh, ungratefulness, not having, a, having an ungrateful heart. Okay, so now there's six sins listed in this verse. Number one, without natural affection. Now, I don't have to take a whole lot to figure out. Now, I know the church has no, the, 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 what the world does is one thing. The church has no business engaging in, politi- in social and political correctness. We have to stay with the Bible. And if the Bible says something is not natural, it's not natural. I don't care what anybody says. They, and, and using the love trump card does not override other scripture. Amen. If the Bible has a clarification in it, then you can't trump it with, oh, we just love everybody. Well, it don't work. Because the writer of the word, the who is love, said it's unnatural. Okay? So unnatural affection, uh, that, that does, it's, and, it's, and it's a storgoia, uh, which is, comes from the Greek storge, which was, you know, a brother love, a meaning non, which, you know, an, an a is a prefix which, that negates it. So it's not normal. It's not natural. It's not right. Okay? In the Greek. Uh, then it says truce breakers. Those who break uh, truces or agreements. False accusers, that's slanderers. 
Uh, incontinent means without self-control. You can't control yourself. Well, people just look at all the stuff that's going on in the world today. I mean, my wife read to me a thing on Facebook yesterday, and I'm like, you've got to be kidding. Now, you know, everybody's, they identify as this. They identify as African American when they're white. They identify as an Indian when they're white. They identify as a woman when they're a man. They identify as a man when they're a woman. Now you've got a guy who is now, uh, they don't even have a word for it. They can't even come up with the word for it. Because he now identifies at 50-some years old as a six-year-old little girl. And his adoptive family, he dresses like a little girl. He's now moving forward. He divorces and lets his wife and his children, grown children, adult wife, had children with them, and now he identifies as a six-year-old little girl. Now, we celebrate, see, when you start celebrating sin and things that are unnatural and that don't have self-control, you open a Pandora's box for everything. Now, 15 years ago, they were locked him up in a padded cell, put him in a straitjacket, and giving him drugs. Now, we talk about how wonderful it is he's come out. Because he's being true to himself. Now he's true to the devil that's operating in him. It's not normal. He has no self-control. All right? He didn't want to work in it. It's just his way of getting out of work. All right? Well, let's just move along. Without self-control. Fierce. That means brutal. Savage. Like wild beast. Uh, despisers of those that are good. That means haters of good. In other, in other words, all that's good, whether in people or things. Have you ever noticed that when a Christian comes out, I mean, you got all the tolerant people. you got all those who march for tolerance and acceptance and equality and oneness and, and all this stuff. And as soon as a Christian says what you're doing is wrong, the venom and the hatred and the vile re- re- repercussions you get because you said what they were doing was wrong. Now, wait a second. If you're tolerant, you've got to accept my position. Hello? If it's equal, my position bears as much validity as yours. No, they're just liars full of the devil. They're of their father the devil. And the lust of their father they will fulfill. And they are haters of all that is good. You see, they don't, they don't care if Islam cuts somebody's head off. It's a misunderstood religion. But let a Christian come along and say you're living an immoral life. And boy, I mean, we need to be crucified, shot, buried, boiled in oil. I mean, soaked in hydrochloric acid, all kinds of stuff. Because we're evil. Because we said that that's wrong for you to dress up like a little girl and live in the house with other small children as a 50-some-year-old man. (laughs) What are you thinking? That's right. All right. So they're despisers of the good. Next verse. Um, Paul says traitors. That's treacherous. Those in Paul's day became hated, hatred. Turned Christians to the, to the Romans for, uh, uh, for, to be killed. Heady comes from a word that means rash, reckless, hasty. Okay? And high-minded means conceited. And we say stuck up. All right? And then lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. They'd rather engage in pleasure than have, have the love for God. Then all these have a form that is a metamorphosis, you know, which, you know, an outline, a semblance of good, of uh, godliness, but they, ne- but they deny the power. Okay. Uh, they, so you got Christians going in church and they all go to, they go to a church or a, a, if you look on the front of the church, it says, Ichabod. That's no Hebrew word that meant the spirit of the Lord has departed. Matter of fact, once, once somebody's child was named Ichabod because they, they, they felt abandoned and so the, the Spirit of God has departed. And so Ichabod's written over the doors of their church, but they go in there and they talk about love and they talk about social justice and they talk about equality and they talk about acceptance and they celebrate everything the Bible says not. Okay? So they're trying to have a form of godliness, but they deny God's power. Okay? They reject God's power. <clears throat> the transformative power that changes a man and woman from being outside of the parameters of what he demands, they deny that under the guise of acceptance and love. All right? So all these people have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Uh, they go through all the motions. They maintain all the external forms. They know nothing of true Christianity um, because it doesn't change their life. Timothy's told what? To turn away. Now, I'm going to sit down. I just want to. My knee just got to catch in it right there. For some reason, I'm going to sit down here and let it uh, get uncaught. All right? 
Well, what do you do? It just it caught and doesn't feel good, so I'm going to let it uncatch. Hallelujah. Uh, Timothy was told to embrace them, to wrap his arms of love around them, to accept them as they are, because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. No, Paul said turn away from them. Hello? From such, turn away. Why? Because that influence brought into the church uh, robs the church of the power it needs to set people free from the very things God's talking about here. All right. Uh, then he goes on and says this. <clears throat> for of such, or for of this sort, are they which crept into houses and, led, and lead captive silly women, laden with sins. Now, women don't get mad. Okay, he's using it as, a, as, a, as an allegory here. Led away with divers lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So he, he says, you know, um, after he talked about all these things, here he talked about men. Then he says, for this sort refers to these men. Uh, they creep. Now that word means that they creep into houses, means to worm one's way in. And in described in into houses, described in terms of female occupants. Um, there's the, these occupants are described as silly, sinful, and sensual. Sensual. Silly women means little women, uh, literally in the Greek means little women, and is a diminutive express, expressing contempt. Okay, it's not a compliment. It could be better translated weak willed women, gullible women, foolish women. Okay, now it's, it's using women here, but it, the thing is, of such are the people who lead people astray, take gullible people, they take weak minded people, they take foolish people, and they deceive them. Okay? All right. They're led captive. Um, same Greek word was used to describe as, as a prisoner of war. They're laden with sins. The idea is here an acute state of guilt consciousness. And they're led away with divers. Lust. That's what they're, sw they're swayed and led away by various evil desires and seductive impulses. Now you got bozos running around. I can fornicate because I'm under grace. It doesn't matter. I still go to heaven. It'll mess you up and it'll mess other people up. The Bible is so full of stuff that is anti the dumb stuff. You need to read your whole Bible and stop listening to dummies. And I said that with a nice. Okay. Then the fourth description here is that they are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now the word ever learning doesn't mean they're not assimilating something. It means they only want to hear the sensational and not the serious or sacred. Possibly they wish to uh, pose as enlightened, learned people, but in truth, they're ignorant of the truth. So here we have ever learning. You've got people who come and they learn, but they, they're not really seekers of the truth. They cut off the truth because they really don't want to hear it. And so the minute it goes cross grains to what they want to hear, they shut it down. I've seen people do it. I've preached right here in the church. I've had people sitting right here. One person is going, my God, that's wonderful. Oh, praise the Lord, that sets you free. Oh, glory to God. Now I can do things for the kingdom. The next person is mad as us. Wet sitting in. Because I just messed with their mess, their, their theology. I messed with their, their ideas. And then he goes, listen to this. Now as Jane, James and Jambres withstood Moses. Now, uh, they're not in the Old Testament. You can't go find them. But... Uh, they are in Jewish tradition, and in Targum of Jonathan, that's, that's an old uh, Jewish historical thing, says they were two of the Egyptian ma magicians that withstood Moses and Aaron when he came to Pharaoh. They throw down the rods and that kind of stuff. So that, the, the belief is that they were two of the magicians that withstood Moses, threw their rods down to withstood them. And so the Bible says here, now as Janus and Jambres uh, withstood Moses, so do these, these same people who are, who are silly, who are laden with sin, who are silly, resist the truth. Now this is stronger than passive resistance. The Greek word here actually means they oppose. They're not just, well, I don't like that. No, they are actually in opposition to it. They're calling people in the church up and telling them, well, pastor, he's wrong because da 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 you know, just like the guy who came here one time and he, was, uh, he had gone to some meeting and he came back, he had revelation uh, that he shouldn't have got um, about how that the Holy Spirit wasn't a person. There's only, there's only God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit's an it. Why do you say that? Well, because Romans says the Spirit itself. Okay, bozo, they use grammatical rules of interpretation or translation. The word spirit is genderless in the Greek, and so the pronoun for it's genderless. But he's also called the comforter and says he. Okay? When the comforter, the parakletos, that is male gender in the Greek, therefore the pronoun is male gender. 
He, they built a whole doctrine on the Holy Spirit not being a third person of the Godhead off of a pronoun translation. Can everybody say dumber than dirt? How about SOS? How, how about SOS? Stupid on steroids. Okay? You don't, the Bible is full of the fact the Holy Spirit's a person. Well, this guy came back and was trying to tell me that the Holy Spirit wasn't a person. He was an it. He was just a force. And I said, well, let's, and we, we, he talked to me until I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I said, look, we'll, we'll talk again. Let me tell you what you, you don't do. Don't you go to one person in this church and tell them that. You know what he did? Left the church when I started telling people. Called him up, went by, see him, started sharing it. So I just got up and started preaching. I took uh, about 12 weeks and preached on the person and work of the Holy Spirit and went line by line, proving from Scripture that the Holy Spirit's a person. He was gone by week four. But that's okay. He had been going all over the church sharing this stuff. I had to straighten it out. Okay? They, they, he opposed the truth. He wasn't interested in truth. He wasn't just passively resisting it and not receiving it. He was going around trying to undo truth. That's opposition to it. Okay? And, of course, the truth is the gospel. Uh, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. The, the phrase reprobate, I mean, men of corrupt minds, indicates depravity and utter corruption, describing those who can no longer understand the truth. Now, the Bible says in the Romans, the um, first chapter, I believe it's the first chapter, when referring to the homosexual. Men let the natural use of the woman and burn in their lust, working with men, men with men, working that which is unseemly. And before that, it said the men, women let the natural use of the man and burn in their lust one toward another. Okay? And then it says, likewise, the men left the natural use of the woman and, you know, and work that which is unseemly. And then it goes on and says, now a couple of verses later, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Same Greek word here. And it means, it means depravity and utter corruption. Un, no longer able to understand the truth. Because they've chosen to work against what God said. Okay? So any church, any, any, any church, I don't care what denomination, I don't care what non-denomination, I don't care how many PhDs, uh, MAs, BAs, whatever you got behind your name, if you get up and say that God accepts homosexuality, you're a liar. Amen. Bottom line, bona fide liar. Because God says he gives them over, lesbians and homosexuals, to, it's the only sin, let me say this, because all sins are the same, it's the only sin listed in the Bible that he gives them over to a reprobate mind. So, I got to think he doesn't, because it's perverse against very nature. And so God says they're reprobate, and the word reprobate means that they are, uh, they're depraved, they're under utter corruption and cannot um, understand the truth. So they go to these little churches. They call them churches, metropolitan community churches. And they get up and tell them that, and they take all the scriptures out of the Bible that, that say anything against it, write their own Bible. They, they, and they leave out all those parts of the scriptures. Just leave that, just happen to leave that part out. You know the Bible says if you take, take anything away. Now listen, putting study notes in the front of the Bible or concordance is not adding to the Bible. You're not changing the meaning of Scripture. But when you take stuff out that changes the meaning, you have taken away. And the Bible says you are a cursed anathema. Yeah. Let me just say this. In the Greek, anathema is not a good term. You don't want to be a cursed or you don't want, and you really don't want to be anathema. Okay? Just, not, just don't seek after it. You don't want to be it. Okay? So they got people writing Bibles or perverting the Bible by removing things that changes the context. And in doing so, you are a cursed anathema. And if you preach from it, you're a cursed anathema. Hello? And if you persuade others, it's a good thing. You're a cursed anathema. You're full of hatred. No, I'm not. I'm telling you that God's already said you're a cursed anathema if you do this. I'm trying to let you know you don't want to be that. It's like me saying, don't go down there to this ridge. Don't go down there and go, go past that sign that says road closed. The bridge is out. You'll fall 50 feet into the river and die. Oh, you're mean. You don't want me to go down that road. No! I don't want you to go down that road. It's not because I'm mean. I want you to live. Okay. So, back here to this word. Depraved, corrupt, and you can't understand the truth. Okay? All right? 
And then the next, uh, 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 I'm sorry, men of corrupt minds. I like the word men. The next word is reprobate, which means not standing the test, worthless, base, rejected. So the, here's how the, uh, the Revised Standard Version takes this part. Of corrupt mind, it says corrupt minds and counterfeit faith. The Revised Standard Version says corrupt minds and counterfeit faith. What do you mean counterfeit? We'll go back up here. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Presenting that you're a Christian and you're living before God, and you're doing right, when all along the Bible says you're not. And men, quote, and I say this with, with every ounce of sarcasm I can muster up. Ministers who tell them they're okay. You know what Jesus said about you, pal? Woe be unto anyone that would cause one of these to stumble. He says, it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and dropped in the sea. You don't want to face. So we're talking about the love of Jesus. You don't want to face the judgment. Brother Hagin said one time that he was, and you remember the book, I Believe in Visions? It was in one of the visions where he was talking to the Lord. And uh, he, he was, the Lord said, you know, if you hadn't done something like that, I couldn't have. He said, Lord, you're... I, you're going to have to, I know you couldn't understand, no, you, you, didn't say, you said you wouldn't. He said, no, I said I couldn't. He did it four times. On the fourth time, he said, the fire in the Lord's eyes. He thought, mm. Then he finally changed his statement. You're going to have to show that to me in the Bible. <laughs> he could have said, I had the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word's established. You're going to have to show that to me in the written word. And then he said, well, I'll show you four. He said, out of two or three, he said, I'll show you four. <laughs> Jesus knows the Bible, Bible better than you do, don't you, doesn't he? Okay, so the corrupt mind, the reprobate concerning the faith. The NIV uh, takes this next verse, verse 9. And here King James says, But they shall proceed no further, for the folly shall be manifest on all men, as also theirs was. The NIV says, But they will not get very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Eventually God will expose this stuff. Okay? Because these men oppose the truth and reject the faith, their end is utter folly. It'll be evident to everyone. Um, here it says um, manifest means clearly evident and plain, so everybody will clearly see. Okay? Timothy was assured that truth will triumph, and thank God truth will triumph. Don't get uptight. Don't get upset. Don't get worried about who's in the political power, and it's all a mess, and it is a mess. But in the end, truth will prevail. Okay? Okay? Um, Timothy, so the cover-up of sin is unwise. <laughs> we don't want to cover up. Those who profess to love and serve God but seek to hide their evil desires and sinful actions will suffer shame in the end. If the sin is not exposed in this life, they're going to face the, the, the Jesus. Anyway, but Paul, now he began, he transitions here. He's talked about types of sin. He's talked about things that you know, happen to them. And he says, but you fully know. So Timothy, now remember, this is a pastoral epistle. Paul writing to Timothy. Paul's writing and, and, and taking his young protege and giving him, really this is his last book that Paul writes before he's, before he's executed. And he, he takes Timothy, his young protege, and so he's giving him instruction. Things he knows will be um, uh, shared with congregations. Also things that to encourage him in his place as a minister. So he kind of got both things going on here. So now he transitions from talking about these things about what people will do and how they are and what happens to them. He says, um, but you fully know my doctrine, manner of life, uh, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity. Uh, boy, he gets, starts listing a bunch of stuff, doesn't he? Patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. What persecutions I endure, but, listen, but the Lord delivered me out of them all. Okay? Um, so Paul says, he said, but thou, in other words, in contrast to the people he's just been writing about to Timothy, um, it's emphatic. Uh, you've known, in the Greek that means literally you have followed alongside. Paul said in one place, he said, follow me as I follow the Lord. Amen. What does that mean? When people are following the Lord, you can follow them. When they're not, you got to stop. If I come in here today, if I come in here and say, I just had a revelation. Jesus isn't the only way to get to heaven. You can get there through Muhammad too. You better pack it up and run. Don't just leave your stuff behind. Just run. Because I'm now no longer worthy of following. I've, I've gone contrawise to the word of God. 
And you're supposed to be t learning and being taught good enough that you know when something's being, when people make changes. A number of years ago, well, it's not that many. It's, it's about, I'd say about 10 years ago now. One of the biggest churches in America at the time, 5,000 members in Tulsa. Uh, everybody went there. People, I mean, we would have meetings going on at Rama, and they'd be having meetings going on over there. I mean, just, you know, big church. And um, pastor was dynamic. Pastor was, you know, now, he was single. Then he got his girlfriend pregnant outside of wedlock after, and had an abortion after he preached against abortion all those years. Now, listen, you know, he, could, he probably could have just come clean and repented and got out of the pulpit for a season under the covering of, uh, of men in Tulsa. Or Roberts was there. Brother Hagan was there. Uh, ministers he could have sat under and gotten restored. Instead, he, could, did a, he, did a, he pulled a David. Except he killed the baby, which is even worse. Okay, then it got released, and uh, everybody, but everybody forgave him. They all forgave him, and he, you know he kept the church, you know, got got past that and stayed big. And uh, but then sometime after that, he got into this thing where he went to. He was invited by a group of homosexuals to come preach, and they washed his feet. They had a with old time foot washing, and he came back and said he's never felt the love of God like Nathan. Behave yourself. He's he never felt the love of God like he did. That, that's, just, that's just garbage. And started preaching that homosexuals are going to heaven. And then after that, he started preaching universalism. As a matter of fact, everybody's going to heaven. Nobody's going to hell. Well, his church went from 5,000 down to 200. And before it got to 200, Brother Roberts had called him to come talk to him. And they had him on ABC. Because this, well, this thing was big. Big charismatic preacher preaching that everybody's going to heaven, that you know, homosexuals are going to heaven. And the ABC News got a hold of it. He said, he said, I can't prove to you a thing I'm preaching out of the Bible, but I know it's true. If you can't prove it out of here, it ain't true. And um, Brother Roberts called him in, and he didn't listen. Didn't listen to these different men that he, quote, had sat under or had submitted himself to. And then went down to where he shut the doors as out of the ministry, 5,000 to nothing. I said 5,000 to nothing. You got to stay with the truth. Amen? You got you to gotta dance with the one who brung you. Okay? You learn to live by faith, and you learn to live in the Word of God and under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You just can't switch over and change to something else. Because if he had preached that stuff to begin with, we'd have never heard of him. Because the church would have rejected it. Okay? But his, his folly, when he got into that. Do you know how many big churches can cover stuff up because they got numbers? But for 5,000 people, his father was manifest to all men, and everything was lost. Everything was lost. He says, but Paul says to him, you've known me, you've known my life. And um, so he, then he enumerates a bunch of his different qualities. His doctrine, his teaching was first. Uh, the major theme, both letters to Timothy, uh, is, is Paul's doctrine. His manner of life, and it means how he conducted his life. Um, his general behavior, not just, you know, how he was in the pulpit, how he acted in life. I mean, he went out in life, he, was, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't, you know, we, you know, your love and grace and everything in the pulpit, and then a jerk out outside the pulpit. I've been, I've been around people like that. They treat you like a dog outside the pulpit, and they get in the pulpit because they're, on, they're, they're showing out and they have their thing going on. They make sure everything looks good. Let me just tell you, you get, what you get with me is what you get with me. I'm, I'm, I'm me outside. I'm me in here. Thank you. All right. Um, his purpose, his chief aim, his, Paul's goal. So he says, his, his faith, the body of truth that, uh, that was consistent with the gospel, his long suffering uh, denotes patience, especially with people. Sometimes. Lord, can I lay hands on them? Remember, the Bible says, lay hands on no man suddenly. That's talking about ordination, but we like, we like to tease with that. Can I lay hands on them hard, fast, and continuously? I mean, there have been times, you know, you, you know, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We're thinking, I got it. 
You don't have to bother. Well, I have got it. Don't even look in on it. I got it covered. Okay? Now we have to be patient even with people. Charity is agape, the God kind of love. Patience. Hupomene, which is a form of hupomino, and, it, you know, and is translated endurance or steadfastness. Okay? It's not passive patience. It's active mastery of the ups and downs of life. Okay? His list continues with persecutions and afflictions. Paul received in his, men, his, his work in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Um, he, these are the places he, he got in trouble because sometimes. He declared, but out of the Lord, the, the God delivered me out of them all. He even got delivered from a premature death. Remember, he was stoned and left for dead. Remember that? that he was preaching. So See, people get this idea that if, you pre if everybody loves you, you're preaching the right stuff. I finally come to understand, you can preach the right stuff, they'll want to kill you. They tried, they tried Jesus. Remember they took him out of the city to throw him off the cliff? You know? Y'all remember that? And then Paul, well, they did stone him. They took him out and stoned him. Now, they, now listen, and left him for dead. Can I say something? The man was dead. How do you know he was dead? These people were expert stoners. They knew how to kill folk. All right? They knew exactly what to do to put you down. So, they, and so now, Paul was taken out here in the region of Galatia. This is in the, you know, Antioch and uh, Lystra and Iconium. So this, is the re, this, this region is there, the region of Galatia. Um, remember, he wrote this letter to the churches at Galatia, not the church of Galatia, the churches in the, at Galatia. And so it's a region. We've, we've done that in our studies on the maps and stuff. And um, left him for dead. Now, most Bible scholars believe that that is when he... He knew a man above 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but such a woman was called up into the third heaven and heard things unlawful to be uttered. Okay? Most people believe, most scholars believe that's when Paul died, went to heaven, had, had the, the revelation that we call the Pauline revelation that he took him the rest of his life to write out in, in his, his writings. Okay? When he was left for dead. He said, I, could, I couldn't tell you if I was in the body or out of the body. Why? Because man's a spirit. Possesses a soul, lives in a body. He died, went into the presence of God, saw, saw the new creation. Saw things unlawful to be uttered. By revelation through scripture, it took him another 30 years to write all that out and bring us the new creation realities, to bring us the redemptive truths that Paul wrote. Hallelujah. But, you know, he, he, so he, he, he um, had a premature death that he got raised from the dead from. Um, but his triumphant words uh, reflect the words of the psalmist in Psalm 34, 17. He said, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Though in prison when he wrote, Paul was consistently aware of the hand of God on his life. Now remember this is, remember this is his second imprisonment. He's finished his missionary journeys. He's, he's, he's basically on his way uh, to be executed in Rome. Paul now moved from his own experiences in verse 12. Uh, he begins and says, yea, and all that live, will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Why are we trying not to be persecuted by being cool with everybody when the Bible says we're going to suffer persecution? So if you're not getting it, you ain't doing something right. Well, I don't want to say anything that offends anybody. You are to say the truth. And if it offends them, that's tough. Now, you're not to be arrogant. You're not, trying to be, you're not trying to offend them, but you still have to tell the truth. You can't circumvent the truth for the sake of not being persecuted. Well, people might not like me. You know, when I worked at um, Parker's in Greenville, um, when I, I, I worked 76 to about 84 part-time, full-time, off when I went to Rama, you know, <clears throat> just, you know, during that, those uh, years. But uh, when I was working the full-time, after I came back from Rama and I was working full-time, um, although I was a computer programmer, uh, you, you, had, you know, they want you to work nights and weekends. I'm trying to be in the ministry. I got to go to church on Wednesday nights and be church on Sundays. No, nope, we need for you to work with nights and weekends. The only jobs they were what they call what they call entry level jobs. You would go in and run the system three shops. That dates me, doesn't it? 
uh, Bill and Dick. IBM System 3 was, was a mini computer. Your, your PCs are microcomputers. Uh, it took up the platform at least for that, for that computer. Um, but they wanted you to work nights and weekends. I was an RPG programmer, and, and I wasn't going to do it. So I just went back to working, cooking chicken. Because I was, I was determined that, you know, I wasn't going to let a career stand in the way of following what God had for me. And that was the ministry. And um, so I was working in the kitchen, and I and kind of worked my way up to assistant kitchen manager. And when the, when the other guy wasn't there, you're, you're the kitchen manager kind of thing. And uh, back in the day, you know, back in the day, and they, they've come a long way since then. Back in the day, we had white boys and black girls because the management didn't want the boys and girls fraternizing. You think the color of the skin stopped it? Are you kidding me? Oh, come on, give me a bite. You know, so that that was now that's it's totally different now. I mean, you know, they 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 they've come of age. You know, you got everybody working. You got you know, every race working everywhere. But anyway, back and that's what it was back then. So um, the girls, being in African American culture, would call me brother because I was saved. They, Janie would come in with pants on or a blouse on, and they'd say, "Brother, your wife ain't saved." Why is that? Because you you're not supposed to wear that which pertaineth to a man. She had on pants. I said, the guy that wrote it had on a dress. <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, robes. They wore robes. They wear a dress. But um, they, would, they would make fun of me. They'd mock me. Unless they would say brother with a twang. It won't, it won't complimentary. But let me tell you something. I would not, tell, I would not refuse, how, how can I say this? I don't want to do a double negative. I did not withhold the truth from them just because they mocked me over it. Because you see, they'd come into work and they'd say, and it wouldn't be brother with attitude, it would be brother. I found a lump this morning. So that's, that, that's no big deal for God. We just step out of the kitchen, out into the, the breezeway there, and I'd, I'd lay hands on top of the head, and I'd command it to disappear. And I said, now go to the bathroom. And they'd come back and say, I can't find it. They'd come in. Now, you got to understand, that some things haven't changed a lot. You know, single-parent households, got children at home. They need the money. They say, I, I can't work today. I'm sick. I said, tell me, let me, let me, let me do something. Let me pray for you. You go sit in the break room, and in 20 minutes, if you can come back and you still don't feel good, you can go home. I'd go pray for him. I'd see him come back, clocking in, going to work, because God healed him. And how all these kind of things are going on all, all the time. I mean, miracles. I mean, cancer, growths, sickness, uh, all kinds. Of, just praying for him and loving on him, even though they mocked me. But then they started coming to work one day. Brother, I got saved last night. I went to church and got saved last night. They didn't come to my church, but they got saved. I don't care what they got saved. They got saved. We had a revival. I said, we had a revival. Well, now do you know what they do down there? Now, the, 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 the Parker's agreement was started by Mr. J.C., the elder Parker, and his son, J.D., Doug. So they were Julius Doug and Julius. I don't remember Mr. Parker's middle name. I, I, all, I knew, we all, all we knew, we were told to call him J.C. And, and Doug. That's because that keep them apart. He said, Mr. Parker, you had two of them. So it was J.C. and Doug. And, um, and uh, so Mr. Parker passed on, but Doug's son, Billy. Now, Billy was about this tall when I started working there, and he was a, he was a little short. He looked like SpongeBob SquarePants. He didn't have a neck. He had just sat right down on his shoulders. If Billy watches this, I'm in trouble. And, uh, I mean, he'd come in with his hat on the back of his head, his hands in his pockets, you know. Because, <laughs> they, you know, they, ate, they came in and got food and ate all the time for free. And uh, I believe seed we planted back then, because I had another worker that was an old Pentecostal hold this orphanage boy. Went and prayed for him one day back in the storage room. He got thrown up on the stock, and, and he came back into the kitchen drunk in the Holy Ghost. Brother, yeah. I mean, he was. God just nailed him. I'm telling him, like the day of Pentecost. And, um, but now, on Wednesday nights or Thursday nights, I forgot what night of the week it is, 
after the restaurant shuts down, they have a corporate chaplain who comes. They take one end of the restaurant, they set up chairs, and they have a church service. And they have gotten so many people, they've gotten like 60 people saved in the past two years that work there from their corporate chaplain program. Amen. It won't always that way. Some, of them, some people may not know it. It was known as the, uh, the drug dealing place in Greenville. I didn't even know it. I, did, I, I worked there. I didn't even know it. I knew a bunch of guys that worked with were druggies. <laughs> Nathan. <laughs> I was oblivious. Went back, went back one day. I showed you guys the room where they cooked the, uh, the, cook the pigs. And that window was up because they had been cleaning. And I went back, back in that part of the building to get something. And I went, and I went and got one of the guys. I said, hey, hey, so-and-so, come here. I mean, you're talking about pot? It's like they put, a, they put just stacks of it and burnt, were burning it out back for a bonfire. You could smell it was so strong. I said, is that pot? I don't smell nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's right. <laughs> You're one of the biggest users in the place. You don't know that. But now, they're having chaplaincy programs. See, they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're getting people saved right and left. You know, praise God. I said, praise God. That's, that's just a wonderful thing. You know, Billy has a heart to get people saved, and I'm telling you, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. You know, so no longer are they being known as a drug dealing place. Well, I, I found, I mean, they were dealing everything. They were dealing everything. You name it, they were dealing it. And they all work there. They'd come, they'd come in so glassy eyed. One of them was Janie's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> He'd come into work. His, his name was Stonewall. He was stoned to the wall every day. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, it was Janie's cousin. I worked with two of Janie's cousins there. Yeah. They were glassy eyed. Anyway. Boy, I got hung up here, didn't I? Okay. Um, then verse 12. Paul now moves from, from, from Timothy following his life. I'm, I'm just going to kind of, well, listen, there's only um, 20 more verses. No, there's about six. I'm gonna, give me just a few minutes so we can get this one done. I, I did get sidetracked. Uh, he says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And, um, you know, <clears throat> the NIV says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is all through the New Testament. All right, uh, the all that will in Christ means all who desire to live godly or who are so minded or determined, you're going to get persecuted. Stop thinking it's weird that you get persecuted, okay? Um, uh, Barclay's commentary says this, Paul's conviction that the real follower of Christ cannot escape persecution. If anyone proposes to accept the set of standards quite different from the world, he's bound to encounter trouble. Now, we got all these Christians who get on Facebook and change their little profile picture to the, to the homo flag because they want to be accepted by everybody. Sorry. You're going to call me, a, I don't care if you call me a hater. You can call me a homophobe, which is just a, you're, you're a naturophobe. <laughs> there, you're a naturophobe. You're a normal hater. You're heterophobic. <laughs> nanny, nanny, boo, boo. See, I use the same words you use, just like you do. All right. Now we got transphobic. I mean, it's all out there now. You want to go start calling people pedophobics and, and, and pedophile. Because now the term, listen, the term is already being changed to minor attracted adults in psychology terms and, and journals and stuff. You, you people always go there. You always say that we have to pay, we would be pedophiles. That's not true. They're already changing the terminology in psychological journals and writings, referring to them not as pedophiles, but as minor attracted adults. If you don't think it's coming, you, you're the ostrich. 
Okay? He says here, But evil men and seducers shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, so, some see this as a transitional phrase here. Um, uh, a sentence linking Paul's experiences and his charge to Timothy. Okay? And so... Um, that begins in verse 14, but continue down the things. So this is the transition. Evil men and evil doers are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Then verse 14, continue thou in the things which you've learned, having been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. Okay? The seducers, uh, it comes from a word that means wizards or whalers. They're imposters. They wax worse and worse. They go from bad to worse. The literal meaning of whalers here refers to an incarnation of howling and implies that these seducers and posers were using black magic. While deceiving others, they deceived themselves. Okay? Now, in Paul's charge to Timothy in verse 14, he, rem he reminds his son in the faith of the basis of Christian faith. And these verses are the keys to this letter. They could be titled, The Value of the Scriptures. Timothy is to told to um, continue, to abide, to stay. And what he had learned. And be assured. Be convinced. You've got to be convinced. Ministers, you really have to be convinced. Okay? The final clause is no doubt to reference to not only Paul as, as Timothy's spiritual father, but to Timothy's mother and grandmother. Remember his mother Eunice and his grandmother and his mother Eunice? They, they had brought him up in the faith. Okay? Knowing of whom you've learned them. In these last three verses. And from a child you've known the holy scriptures, and we make, which were able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. It means from a babe, from a young child, uh, the sacred writings of the scriptures. Um, a Jewish boy would learn, start learning scripture at age five. By the time he was 13, he was supposed to have his bar mitzvah. Verse 16 and 17. Listen to this. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Literally, all scripture is God-breathed. Okay? Um, and is profitable. Everybody say profitable. Underline profitable. Why? Because the next three words are going to be words that not everybody likes. Okay? For doctrine. Well, we like that. The Acts 4. Actually, 4. For reproof. For correction. For instruction in righteousness. Now, uh, no, we just preach love. We don't correct people. You know, oh, you said this was wrong. You're being judgmental. No, I'm just telling what the Bible says, and that's to reprove you and to rebuke you with the Scripture if necessary. That's not me judgmental. Why? Because the Bible's already judged it. If the Bible's already judged it, and I quote the Bible, I'm not being judgmental. Now, let me tell you this. You need to understand this. You need to be aware politically about some things. And you people need to be Christians. Stop voting for stupid stuff and vote righteously. Because the whole homosexual agenda is not about equality. It is about shutting down the church so the church cannot say what the Bible says because they're going to try to make it hate speech and we won't be able to preach the Bible anymore. It is a tool of the devil to silence the church. To send preachers to jail for hate speech. It's what they are working on. And I, you're just being paranoid. No, I'm being smart. It says here, the Bible says, God breathed. Okay, doctrine, it's teaching. It is important to a correct and understanding of truth and reception of stuff. We have to have good, solid Bible teaching. And ministers, you need to be better, better Bible students. If somebody says, the Lord told me the other day, and you can't prove it with the Bible, chuck it. Garbage can. I get, I get tired of people quoting somebody and they're not even quoting the Bible. You can't prove out what they said in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if you study that, you find that what they said is the opposite of the Bible. Um, so reproof means rebuking or conviction of sin from reading or hearing the word of God is important to conviction, repentance and confession. We have to rebuke, reprove. It is, in, it, is, it is in part of the ministry of the church to reprove people for not walking in accordance with the word of God. That's, I can't help what you call it. It's my job. Well, what happened? Why? Because when you stand before the great white throne of judgment and you stand before the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says, you did this and my word told you not to do that, you can't go. Well, Pastor Ed never said it. I listened to so-and-so on television, and he told me it was okay. I've got a job to do. 
Okay? All right. Uh, number three is correction. Word of God is profitable for correction. And that is restoration to an upright position or a right state. It brings man by, back into proper relationship with God. It corrects behavior, attitudes, and things that are out of right relationship with God. We're supposed to do that. Okay? And then instruction in righteousness is training and discipleship in righteousness. And it's profitable because it gives God's view of life priorities. And then the last verse says this, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished, furnished unto good works. All these uses of scripture have a purpose. What is that? That the man of God may be perfect. That means mature, fit, capable, complete. Um, and thoroughly first on the good works. Furnished means equipped. The result of being fit, capable, and complete and equipped is good works. Okay. Next week, we'll, oh, well, not next week, because next week is the, I don't think we have service next Wednesday night. The following Wednesday night, the last Wednesday night of 2015, we're going to finish chapter 4. And we're going to finish our two-year journey on the Wednesday nights of the life and teachings of Paul. I thought it was going to be three months. It's been two years. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.